will be brief, I promise. <laughs> so um, there were really two things I was going to do today. One is to introduce uh, Dennis Smith, who just joined us last week as uh, Senior Medicaid Advisor um, at DHS. He is uh, in the Director's Office as a direct report to me. Um, Dennis, I am beyond thrilled to have him on our team. Dennis, um, I met Dennis many, many years ago when he was the head of Medicaid at CMS, and I was trying to negotiate a waiver, and he was the person on the other side that we had to get the waiver from. Um, his, 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 uh, he spent his whole career in government, working on Capitol Hill through a lot of the big reforms that were done, and then uh, Medicaid director in Virginia, and then uh, President George W. Bush tapped him to head Medicaid. So for seven years, he was the head of Medicaid for the United States of America, the longest serving uh, leader of Medicaid in the history of HHS. And um, from there, spent a year, two years at Heritage, and then uh, became HHS secretary to Governor Scott Walker. So um, you can imagine how thrilled I was when I was talking to him one day, and he indicated that you know, while he was enjoying life in the private sector, it was very different from actually being where you could really make things happen and would be open to considering coming to work for us full time here in Arkansas. So I have a person who's not only held my positions, but has held positions well beyond mine working with me. So we are beyond thrilled to have him as part of our team. Um, and I just wanted y'all to have a chance to meet him. Would you like to? Say hello. This task force has been, I think, as you know, um, an integral partner for us, and is a lot of the reasons that walking in the door last week, you saw a number of things underway. This task force has been central, as Representative Khan said, to making all that happen and pulling together um, the thought leadership. Thank you very much. Just take a moment to to thank you all. It's an honor and privilege to uh, join you. As Cindy said, I've spent most of my entire career in government service, and you know it's, it's in my blood, and it was just a, a great uh, opportunity to uh, serve the public again. So it's a, it's a privilege to uh, be here with you and uh, serve the people of Arkansas. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to Arkansas. We're glad to have you. And Do you have anything else that you'd like to one quick, a uh, couple of quick other things, just uh, since the agenda had said to give a, a quick update on a couple of, on the reorganization, just to mention a couple of other small items. We did hire um, the last of our chiefs. Uh, our chief human resources officer started on Monday. His name is Glenn Eisenhower. Um, I, we are, he is at the office working now around a number he walked in the door Monday and we gave him a whole bunch of areas and said we need plans really quickly on uh, improving retention and hiring in a number of areas. So he's focused on that. If, um, if it's of interest in October at your next meeting, I'll be happy to bring him and we could give you kind of a look at some of the areas we're going to try to approach in terms of improving workforce and personnel issues. I know a number of you have, have been talking us with, with us about that. Um, so he started Monday, and the, that's the last of our chiefs from our reorganization now hired. We, um, the other thing I do, uh, Glenn does come to us from the private sector. He um, is an Arkansan, but um, took this opportunity to move back to Arkansas to work with us. We hired him out of Pennsylvania, where he was the head of HR for one of the hospital systems there. Um, so he understands that medical side. Here he worked with Nouvelle as their HR person and at AFMC at one point doing some of their HR for a period of time. So we're thrilled to have him and his focus. The other thing I'll just mention S as- Cindy, bef as before, sure. you, before you move off of that, um, I, yes. I've actually talked to some of the people over at the University of Arkansas and uh, I have a couple dinners lined up in October and if you and Glenn would like to join me, uh, it'll be an opportunity to interact with some of the student athletes that are a year or two away from graduating, and some of them may or may not be interested in joining a DHS, for example, and, and kind of starting that. So I'll follow up with you and see if some of those dates work, but that may be a way to connect there. Please do, that would be wonderful. Um, and, and I also want to thank a number of you uh, for your help in 
sending us resumes and introducing us to candidates for different positions, please keep it up because we really are trying, we've got a strong team and we're trying to build an even stronger team at DHS. So please, as you see, talented folks that would like to serve in government, we, we'd like to be the first call uh, for that. So, um, and then the only other thing I have to mention is uh, the legislature, y'all, and the task force, and uh, y'all were wonderful about supporting our effort to um, begin addressing our uh, Medicaid MAGI backlog, one of the first things we started to tackle um, after I got here. Mary Franklin, our head of DCO, is here. I just want to give you a quick report on how that's going. I'm so proud of what they're doing. As you remember, when we first brought this to you, we had over 140,000 cases backlogged, and we set a goal to get ourselves, get through that backlog by the end of the year. Um, Y'all helped us um, move ahead rapidly with some contracts and some temporary manpower assistance, which began about the middle of August um, with uh, E-Systems, Maximus, and AFMC. And um, anyway, middle of August, that began. The report I got from Friday is that um, where we started at over 140,000, we are now down to 71,781 backlog cases. They are working their way through this as fast as they can. The contractors have even put on Saturday shifts. So um, I just want to assure you we are on track and they are working very, very hard and I'm just really impressed at the commitment and focus and progress and we are determined that we will be through this before the year is out. So thank you for your support and help for us to be able to tackle this. Okay, we got a couple questions, or a question here, Cindy, and I, I just wanna let you know, you can go ahead and cover the items in E there if you want. I saw that you've got several items there and you've covered a couple of them, but uh, Senator Rapert, if you wanna ask your question or if you wanna wait till she goes through that, it's up to you. I'll, I'll wait till she's finished and then ask my question. Okay. Okay. On, uh, you know, the RFP for independent assessment, RFP for dental. Oh, okay. Well, those items were gonna be covered by others on my team. Okay. Me, so shall I bring them on up? Uh, yeah, or do you want to do those just, later this afternoon? No, let's just go ahead and get this item out of the way if we can. All right, let me see if everybody's here. Is Misty here? I see Misty. I see Dawn. I see Melissa. Okay. Okay, uh, Senator Raper, you're recognized. Sure. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it's good to see you, Director Gillespie. I wanted to ask her. a question um, definitely related to your updates, I think, on the Arkansas Works, et cetera. I think that you're aware of the committee meeting that we had, which was the Legislative Oversight Committee for the Marketplace. Um, are you aware that we had a meeting uh, that brought up some funding that was showing in a federal report in June that was filed? Yes, sir, I heard about that. Okay. Uh, and for members that weren't there and for the chairman, uh, it, I don't know if you even know about that, but I actually have the copy of the report that was called the blueprint blueprint report that was filed in june mm -hmm. and that this was a report that was i believe to show sustainability it's the sustainability report the sustainability report for the uh, ahem in the marketplace correct that would be my understanding right. that is not a report we file i know it's not okay. uh, but it showed over $50 million actually coming from the Department of Human Services to AHIM uh, to fund uh, their, uh, I guess, proposed work uh, for the state of Arkansas and for DHS. Is that correct? I saw the report. I mean, I saw the report last week after this was all raised. So are you telling me that you were totally unaware of the, of the DHS funding in June that they filed with the federal government? That report isn't filed by us, so we would not have, I would not have seen that report. Are you telling me then that you are unaware that they filed a report showing that money going to, uh, is in that federal report? Yes, I mean. Okay, I wanna ask you again. So you, are, you are unaware that they were filing that report in June I, uh, Senator, I, I don't want to, to get caught on words. Let me be very, very clear. That's why I ask you. And, I, and I appreciate that, and I, I, <laughs> yeah. I understand 
Yeah. But your, ten, your intention is not to try to catch me up on some kind that's of That's why I ask you twice so you I, can clear that up because I don't think that's the first answer is really where you want to stay. If you're saying I received it, I, I don't know where you're, where you're going with it, so let me just be real clear. I don't know and keep in my head the filing deadlines for when AHIM has to file blueprint reports. Um, we were in discussions with AHIM at that point okay, about AHIM working with us. Um, we never approved in any way that sort of number. I, if that document passed my emails, if that's what you're saying, it may have, but I did not read it, or I would have said, hello, this is not, we have not yet reached an agreement on a number. By the time we had worked our way through an, um, a memorandum with them as to the services we thought we needed, there were early discussions going on. They thought on their side that we needed more support from them than we thought we needed. Those discussions led to a series of back and forth meetings where our folks worked through what is it we need you to do, what is it you're going to do, what will that cost, how do we do it, and that led to an MOU. That MOU is what we expect to spend with them. At what point, and again, I did not mean a gotcha question. Uh -huh. but and that's why I'm trying to be really seemed, clear. It seemed to have turned into that, so I ask it again. Because AHIM had enough confidence in their discussions with DHS in June that you filed a report that showed 18 million coming from DHS to the marketplace in 16. <laughs> 9 million in 17, 9 million in 18, and 8 million both of 19 and 20. The problem is that when Act 1500 was passed, which is the basis upon which this entire task force is now meeting, there was a clear understanding that never would one dollar of state taxpayer money go to support the marketplace. So when I asked the question very innocently the other day, it seemed as if we say here in Arkansas, a covey of quail took to flight. Because nobody could even tell me and acknowledge that this report that I'm looking at in black and white today even existed. And the issue with that is that if you had a conversation with the marketplace in June there should have been a discussion with the legislature probably in May. When you have AHIM filing a report with the federal government showing state taxpayer dollars from DHS, and they file that in a sustainability report, there's an obligation not only on AHIM, but an obligation upon DHS to come and discuss that with the legislature to see if we would even support that money moving. And so, now I understand that I asked the questions and things the quail seems to have lit in the field, so to speak, that now that there is a discussion of money at a much reduced rate that's going. Is that correct? Are you going to be contracting with AHIM for... Right. Go ahead. If I can clarify, just to make sure I'm, I'm clear on the record. We don't file that report. DHS does not file that. So I just want to make sure I'm, I'm clear I'm, I'm about that. I'm clear on that, but the okay. problem is that it's money from your department. That, that AHIM was projecting that yes. they would receive from us. And we have not, and I do want to be clear, we are not planning to pay AHIM those kinds of dollars. We have worked through with AHIM what our services are that we need. Yeah. And we have signed an MOU with them that reflects that amount of money, and that is in our budget. Um, I, I, I believe, if I'm, if I'm, let me just, just say here at this point, uh, I've looked at the numbers that came out in the uh, meeting the very next week. And by the way, just so that the committee knows, even the chairman of the oversight committee had not been given a copy of the blueprint report from AHIM. And they were quite concerned that I had the report, though the report is, should have been filed and should have been overseen by our committees many, many weeks prior. And again, I just stumbled into what has 
been a real stumbling point here for all of us. Because in June, what happened is that a report was filed with the federal government showing the sustainability of the Arkansas health insurance marketplace. And in that report, it actually showed $50 million of Arkansas state taxpayer money going to fund the marketplace that all of us know we were never going to put any dollars into. Isn't that correct? That is correct because I saw that last week. That's after correct. You, after you were, as you said, the uh, cubby of quail, you know, when we got the inquiry, we went to find out what the document was because, as we said internally, so, we're not planning to pay $50 million for and this. I'm about to finish so. up, Mr. Chairman, but I will tell you that what I found when I began asking those questions is I really settled on this. Someone at DHS gave that group at AHIM a lot of confidence or they probably would never have put nearly $50 million in DHS funding in their report. The only other option is if they did not have that confidence from someone at DHS to do that, then it appears that they engaged in what you might call puffery because they filed a report showing state taxpayer dollars going into AHIM at a very large amount. I wanted to ask okay, you today because right, it's the Senator. opportunity and I'm finishing here, but I will tell you that what I now see is that there's a total of two and a half million dollars above the cost of what appears you say you're going to pay PCG through AHIM. Is that, is that correct? There's money being transferred from DHS to AHIM. For AHIM to conduct, a, for AHIM to handle the ESI portion of Arkansas Works for us. And I thought it was, you know, if you, if I could just very briefly explain. Um, the, my thinking, and I will say it was my thinking around, as we started looking for um, someone to work with on Arkansas Works ESI. Um, so what I, what I was thinking was the ESI program is aimed at working with small employers and I didn't want um, me our Medicaid to begin trying to work directly with small employers. I didn't think that would be terribly successful for small employers to be told call Medicaid and work with Medicaid. Um, we would like to make that portion of Arkansas Works successful and would like to figure out how to have um, an entity that we work with that can work with small employers. It's, um, it seemed like it made sense to piggyback on an entity that was already there and was funded and we wouldn't have to go hire full-time personnel around it or support a, a full contract. So our thinking in beginning the discussions was that if we could work through with them, since what they do every day is work with small employers, for them to uh, do this and us piggyback on them versus pay for the whole thing, that I would be being efficient. Um, you know. And, and I understand, and, and I've had a lot of phone calls about all of this since I asked the questions. The problem is Act 1500 and special language that even Representative Bell had included in many budgets that never ever was any of the state taxpayer dollars from your department or any others to be used to support or prop up or be dependent upon by the exchange, which we said would run on its own with the fees that it collects and would never be spending any state taxpayer dollars to support it. So that's the problem. The problem also is, is that I do not intend for our state government to devolve to the same kind of tactics at the federal government. The fact is our legislature is an oversight body and we are to be consulted, especially when there is movement of dollars of amount that they put in that federal report. Frankly, even if it's $50, especially when Act 1500, the spirit of which we said never would use those taxpayer dollars, was the essence of how it even got passed 
and even brought into, into being the private option that we're discussing today. Uh, at another time, Senator, probably our oversight uh, committee, uh, I will finish getting into the numbers because what I see on this report I'm looking at from last week is that the amount of dollars that it's going to cost AHIM to provide the service that is passing through to PCG actually is much less than the amount DHS is transferring to AHIM. I see here a number that it totals nearly two and a half million. So I really wanted to make sure that I don't fail to bring this up when you're here and Arkansas Works is on the table because I'm now very concerned. And I'm now very concerned uh, not only about the fact that we were not consulted properly earlier this year, and I'm concerned also the fact that this does seem to violate the spirit of Act 1500 in which it was passed, which we were never ever going to put state taxpayer dollars mm -hmm. into the exchange. And I do hope you understand it was never my intention to violate the spirit of anything or not to be reaching out. Um, we you, you, were, you, were, the, you weren't here, Cindy. I mean, yeah. that's, that's number one, Director. You weren't here when Act 1500 was passed, so I don't hold you to a standard there on that, but now that you are here and your staff understands what was the intent, we need to make sure that we're honoring that. And, and this actually, in some ways, there's people that have concluded that um, they've used terminology that I won't use, that the money is perhaps going to a place being put to a different purpose than what you could do with it at the DHS. So again, the appearance. Mm -hmm because they can enroll, they can use the money for things that you're prohibited from using the money for. And that's where the 50 million shocked several of us. And now that the money is reduced, we see this. I just wanna make sure that members definitely know, Mr. Chairman, that th these sorts of transfers and these issues, especially as it relates to the spirit of Act 1500, have to be remembered. All right, Senator. Uh, and let me just say, and I appreciate uh, Cindy and the staff responding. If you've got an item like this, I allowed a lot of latitude here because it can, there is some parts of Arkansas Works that are related to particularly the ESI portion of what AHIM is doing. But if you have something that is really not on the agenda, let us know so we can get it on the agenda so folks can come with the information that, that you need for all of us. Uh, I think that's, that's fair to all of us. Uh, Representative Hammer, did you still have a question or are you? Okay. All right, do you want to cover the rest of the items here that are actually on the agenda and we'll press through those and if some of the folks there want to comment on those, identify who you are and you're recognized. Okay. Good morning, Melissa Stone, Director of the Division of Developmental Disability Services. I think I'm on here to give an update about the um, Home and Community Based Waiver waiting list. So as of September 15th, 2016, we have 3,045 individuals on the DDS waiver wait list. 1,410 um, of those individuals are children. 1,635 of those are adults. What is the trend on that? What, what was it over the last two or three months? It looks like we have had, according to the data, we've had 69 people apply and be deemed eligible um, in state fiscal year 2017. Okay. And we do, what we are seeing an increase, I think, due to the um, amount of discussion that we're having around the wait list. We, we have, um, you know, topped that 3,000 mark that we were kind of on for a long time. So I do think um, the governor um, being at the tobacco um, settlement board and um, discussing um, re reassigning that money has, um, we are getting a whole lot of phone calls from people and, um, and I do think that the number will continue to rise. So but it's gonna require legislative action to make that change, so those yes, dollars sir we won't see any potential decrease until after that's all passed and changed. Yes, sir. All right, Representative Hammer, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
can you remind me of the assessment of the current 3,045 to determine that they all still need services or want services, or how is that in the mix of any decisions we would make? So we've done a variety of, um, of things with the wait list over the past year. Um, thanks to actually having an independent assessment contract in place for the last couple of years, it has given us the opportunity to really reach out to the people on the wait list, verify their contact information. Um, I think you guys might have heard me talk about, we actually at one point in time worked with DCO on the answer system to get up to date addresses and we ended up doing a lot of um, door knocks where waiver staff actually, if we couldn't get a hold of people, we went to their home um, and um, verified that they wanted to remain on the wait list. And at that point in time, we had around um, 2,800 that we um, verified either by phone calls, um, certified return uh, letters, or by actually going to their home. Um, then since that time, we've made a, a big effort to keep in contact with those individuals. So we actually um, check in with them every six months to make sure that their contact information is correct, um, ask if they would still like to be on the waiver wait list. We do not remove people um, if they do not get back in contact with us. We simply continue to keep trying. We might move them to a deferred list. But in order to get off of our wait list, they have to put in writing that they want to be removed. So I'm confident that the people on the list, um, we are, we've been in contact with them. They've been deemed to meet the categorical qualifications um, that, we, um, that we are under, and our psychology team has deemed them to be eligible for that institutional level of care diagnosis. So the 3,045 is a solid number as of today, or how, how old is that documentation to substantiate that 3,045? I'm confident that that number is a is a valid number. That was the number that was given to me as of September 15th. Um, due to the amount of time we, we stay in contact with the individual on the wait list, I'm confident that's a very um, accurate number. Okay, and the 3,045, you just referenced that they stay on the list whether you can get hold of them or not. Do you know what number you've not been able to get hold of? Because we would want to subtract that off that 3,045 if a miracle happened today. So. We, we do run, um, my staff keep a deferred list, so they keep contacting a deferred list, and then once they make contact, they insert them back into the wait list. I can get you that number. Okay, I'd like to have that maybe to the okay. chair so we know what the, what the accurate number is. And are you, are you gonna be here this afternoon for item um, G, the report on the Human Development Centers? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, I'll defer to then, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, good morning, Ms. Stone. So you're over developmental disabilities, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so we have this $835 million target that the task force is focused on. And in my understanding, again, I'm not an expert in this arena the way you are, that nursing homes, behavioral health, and DD were the three big spending areas. So there's a heavy burden on your shoulders, right? Okay, the burden is very heavy. We're into it now with the MOU with the nursing homes, so there's a plan that's moving forward. In behavioral health, as you know, we're fighting through a process, uh, and you can see the heavy lifting and the heavy weight that's going on. So what, what I'm doing right now is sharing that with you and letting you know that, that we're looking, I particularly am looking for the same kind of next steps to be coming forth from your shop as well. Does that sound right? Okay. Absolutely. Okay, thank um, you. Absolutely. I think we're going to talk more about DD in particular at the October meeting, but I think the Stephen Group is prepared to talk about the efforts that we have been doing um, on the agenda for today. Yep, that's true. Representative Ferrari, you recognize? <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. I think um, Representative McCall has asked my question, but I'm gonna, he did it a lot better than I'm going to. And it was nice to talk to you on the phone yesterday, too. Um, we've been battling this for five or six months. And uh, I guess the question is, where are we at with the funding or the numbers? Where, where are we? On the projected savings numbers? All, all, all of it. I mean, from what the cost is, where the money's coming from. 
I, so, we've been doing this for a long time, and it's right. just, I, you know, I, I've asked this question in the last two meetings, and still haven't got an answer. Thought we'd have one this time. So that's kind of what I'm asking. And this may be a question for Stephen's group, but I'm just going to ask you what's Let in Let me just now. say the Stephen group is going to speak to this. Okay. Uh, and and I, as I asked earlier, you know, until the legislature approves the transfer of some of the funds that have been proposed, there's not been a dramatic change in the funding stream. And as you also recall, there were some efforts in the special session, but nothing that I know of has dramatically changed in the funding stream. Is that, is that right? As far as um, serving additional people on the home and community-based waiver, yes, that's correct. But we, we have been working um, diligently over the last year to come up with transformation efforts to achieve the savings. Um, and John's going to speak outlined. to that. Okay, is there, is there, but there's nothing that you need from us or some you're not getting numbers to get this done? No, sir. I think we're in a good spot. I think we'll um, be detailing that next month. But I think they're going to give an overview today, is my understanding. That's correct. Okay, so okay, thanks. And it was nice to speak to you too. Yeah, no, thank you. Okay. We want to go on to the uh, RFP for independent assessment. Yes, I'm Misty Eubanks. I'm Chief Procurement Officer for the Department of Human Services. And um, on the independent assessment, there's two pieces to that actually. One, an RFP for independent assessments, and then a companion RFP for provider transfer uh, transformation. On provider transformation, that will be a more time-limited contract between um, one and two and a half years, and that's really to get providers where they need to be and to help assist them through the changes that will be coming through independent assessments. Currently, we are working with the Office of State Procurement and their contractor on the drafting phase of both of these RFPs. Um, we're gathering the business requirements and what will be the specific specifications. We have internal subject matter experts from the divisions that you all spoke about recently, uh, DD, behavioral health, and aging, who are all sitting in and helping formulate the business requirements and specifications. In addition, we'll be adding um, a team member from the Stephen Group who will be helping and assisting us as a subject matter expert, looking across other states who've already been through these transformations, um, seeing what lessons have been learned, what tools are available to us, and what potential spends and savings are out there across the country. In fact, there is a conference call today with many of those team members, and we've set a very aggressive schedule um, in that most of the team team members who are serving as subject matter experts are devoting um, about two days per week over the upcoming um, two to six weeks to get these business requirements done. And then the hope is that we would be releasing these RFPs on the street uh, late October, early November for providers to then respond to. And as you know, we've done some groundwork around this with the request for information that was released uh, several weeks ago, and all of that information is publicly available on our website. So that's where we are with the independent assessment and provider transformation piece. Um, we're also looking at an RFP for care coordination. That continues to be on the table and on track. Uh, we're looking for the same implementation timeline as far as July the 1st of 2017. However, it has a separate release date. We really feel that we need um, to kind of bite off what we can do now, get that out on the street, and then look at, at care coordination. But we're doing those on parallel tracks as we speak. Um, and we'll be hopeful that that should be uh, out in December or early January timeframe, again, for implementation in July of next year. So I'd be happy to entertain any questions around those three potential RFPs. Okay, we do have a couple. Let me just start though. Do, do one of the things that we found early on in the task force, and I guess John, maybe you guys can nod your head to this, is that we had not always written our RFPs with performance requirements and clawback revisions. Are we doing things differently now than we were with the way we're writing these? Absolutely. So we're working very closely with the Office of State Procurement. As you may recall, they have an independent contractor who's coming in to assist us, who's specifically in the health and human services arena. They've been helping us a lot around dental managed care, and I think you'll see that the quality of the business requirements as well as any of the deliverables and potential damages will be far increased. John, do you all agree with that? 
All right, uh, Representative Miller, you recognize? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was delayed in getting my button pushed. If would it be okay if I had a question, Miss Stone? Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, Miss Stone, for being here. Um, first of all, I just uh, want to say I really appreciate you and your department, and that you know y'all know that I've been working on the the waiting list situation, and and y'all have always been great uh, with with getting me the information. Uh, just. I guess for a matter of clarity and for the record, um, the current folks that are on the, the, the DD waiver that we have right now, the funding coming for that is a mixture of both federal and state dollars at the, at the normal Medicaid match. Is that correct? Yes. And what, uh, what exactly what federal department, I guess there's a uh, kind of a three-part question here. The, could you name for the record the, the federal department that sends the, that sends the money for that, number one. Number two, um, about how much, if we're talking about each individual waiver for the individuals that are on the current DD waiver, um, about how much money is that all total that goes uh, per waiver. Okay, so I'm going to let Dawn give the the first one, my Medicaid, the Medicaid expert, on the exact name of the department that it's sent from. Okay. <clears throat> uh, for the record, Dawn Staley, Deputy Director for Health and uh, Medicaid Director at the Arkansas Department of Human Services, uh, and the federal funding agency um, for the federal Medicaid portion uh, of those dollars comes from CMS, which is the Centers for Medicare. And Medicare, excuse me, Medicare and Medicaid services, which is part of the broader Department of Health and Human Services for the federal government. I wanted to come out of the mouth of the Medicaid director. Um, as for the current recipients on the um, home and community-based waiver, um, the average cost right now is 50, about 54,000 for just their plan of care, and then of course any kind of um, medical Medicaid is um, there's an average costs about $18,000 per person that's on top of that number. Um, and um, you're correct, it is a, a, a regular um, match um, where the federal government um, uh, matches the state general revenue. What was your last question, okay. Representative Miller? Uh, well, I guess what uh, the last question would be, if you're saying, did you say it's about 54000 Per person is the way it averages out. That uh, is. So I guess the overall you asked the overall cost. So the the, the last number I saw an uh, uh, estimate about would be I think it was about two hundred million for the people that are on the waiver right now. Okay, but you said fifty four thousand, and then there was a eight eighteen thousand on top of that. Yes, sir. And That's an average. An average. Okay. Um, do y'all? And I know y'all probably don't have this right now, but if you could um, provide it, I think that would be very helpful. Uh, about what is the the state of Arkansas, what is DHS paying out per person on average for the, and how many folks are on, how many folks do we currently serve on this waiver right now? We have um, allowance from CMS to serve um, 4,000, it's a little under 4,200 people. So it's a point in time number. So exactly, we probably have about 4,000, 160. I would have to go back and check that number. Do, do you do you know when the last time that our allowance, our, our allowable number has gone up? How long ago was that? Well, currently, actually, our number, um, we, our waiver, the uh, home community based waiver for um, DDS is um, in review right now. So I think you guys have heard me talk about we were operating under an extension. Um, that uh, they finally said, we need you to go ahead and file um, an amendment. And so what we're doing is we're, we've, that amendment's being reviewed, and once approved, we're going to turn back around and heavily edit that amendment based on um, what happens with the independent assessment contract and all the transformation efforts we're trying to do that begin July 1. So right now, the only change that's substantial to the DDS home and community based waiver is we added 100 additional slots for children who are in foster care 
because um, they had utilized, they had previously um, paid to have specific slots for their children and those slots have been utilized. And so um, we, they have asked and we, we asked for 100 additional slots for those kids. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Hammer, you recognize? Thank you. Uh, and one thing, Melissa, if we could get that number by this afternoon, it shouldn't be that hard to grab that number, should it? The number of people on the deferred list at this right. point in time? Yes, sir, I can do that. Okay. And then when we talk about care coordination and who's going to be receiving those services, what population are we talking about that you were referencing a while ago? Um, the individuals who receive services on the home and community based waiver. Okay. And as far as today, the providers that are on the home uh, that are representing that, that group, are we in good standing with all them or where are we with the home and care providers? So um, as we kind of did, we discussed at joint performance review, um, we are currently finishing up the documentation that you requested so that we can get that to Ms. Holiday for your review. Okay. Um, so it's coming. Okay. And because in the back of my mind, if we, if we were to have a miracle where 3,045 or whatever the true number is, were to be placed out into the community, do we have the providers to meet the needs of those without, um, you know, creating an adverse effect as far as being able to provide good quality care, number one, and then with all the discussions going on about the human development centers, if any of that population shifted to the community, can you give us an assessment of whether the providers are out there and, and what kind of effect would we have? So if the tobacco settlement money, if there is legislation and that passes and the money is reassigned to assist people who are on the wait list, we had estimated it would be somewhere between 500 and 900 people depending upon um, what kind of system we put them in because we continue to work on a tier-based waiver um, with capped tiers to best effectively utilize our dollars. So the reason of the, the vast range is the 500 number would be if they go into our current system, our current waiver where the average cost is 54,000, um, we of course could serve more individuals um, if we were able to um, put in place a capped tier-based waiver for those people. As for our provider network, um, we have, um, last time I checked, around 70 um, people, providers that provide home and community-based services to clients on the DDS waiver. I think Director Gillespie has probably talked to many of you guys about um, her wish to see um, us cultivate that provider network across all the special needs populations um, so that we can increase um, our providers out in the community. I would say that when a, when a person is allotted a slot on the waiver, um, it takes about 90 days to build a plan for that individual because everything is tailored to the person. So it might even be they go find an apartment, they find staff, they train those staff. So I had asked um, staff, when the governor made his announcement, I had asked um, my assistant director over the waiver, Ms. Regina Davenport, to put together a transition team to go ahead and start planning um, about how we can effectively um, transition people day one if we are um, given that money on July 1st so that we have a plan in place that so we can start transitioning people quick and early so we can get the most transitioned. But I, I would hate to, to insinuate that on July 1 we'll be able to serve 900 individuals because um, this will take time and we will have a plan in place of how that's going to work. And a lot of that's going to be driven by that independent assessment isn't that independent assessment going to drive a lot of determination about what services they get, which is going to be necessary for the provider network to understand the population they're going to be getting? Is that a fair statement? Yes, sir. Okay. And currently with the providers that you have, have we cleared up all the problems with the providers that are out there or are there issues that are, that are lingering that need to be addressed? Because one thing I want to make sure is we've got good quality providers out there and not providers that are that are taking the money but not providing the services and are we going to do something to screen those providers to make sure that we filter out the bad actors 
Yes, sir. So the, one of the benefits that's come from some of the recent attention on one of our providers is that we've able to give a hard look at how our licensure and certification unit is running. And um, Director Gillespie's actually kind of heading um, what that would look like if we um, transform that across the department. But as far as um, short-term plans within DDS, we have put a, a number of measures in place to um, to uh, effectively monitor um, our waiver providers as well as our day treatment providers. Um, I have brought in additional staff. Um, we have started a new reporting system. Um, we have been very busy the last two weeks um, putting um, more measures in place to ensure the safety of our clients. Okay, and for the sake of time, just a question, question, question to Director Gillespie. So is it fair to say that all the issues with the providers that are out there, you as the director are personally aware of all the things that are going on? <laughs> you know that. Are you aware of you everything going on? The you will be aware of everything that's going on. Is let me say it. Let me say it. I, I can't say I know I'm aware of everything going on because what if there's something I'm not aware of? What I have, I mean, seriously, you, you understand that. What, um, what I have done is working with Melissa, with, you know, with Director Stone, with Director Cloud, with Director Green, with, uh, with uh, Deputy Director Staley and others, and most importantly, probably with our General Counsel, David Sterling. What we have done is come together and as she and others are looking and improving and strengthening what's happening within their divisions, we are also putting in place some department-wide first steps, and it is only first steps. Okay. Um, one of those is all licensing actions are going before, uh, through our Office of Chief Counsel for review before we take action. We've also started a department-wide quality review committee of these division directors that is meeting regularly to review all incident reports and share information among among each other. And then, as you know, um, Chief Counsel Sterling is um, implementing a policy review committee at DHS, and one of their first actions is to work with the division directors to review our policies around licensing and quality and come back with a um, set of improved uniform policies. And then um, we have several other actions that we have in consideration that um, the division directors are working together to come forward with. So you're gonna see us continuing to take more action in this way across all of our populations. Okay. So Just everything I'm aware of, we're acting on. Is Just maybe the way to answer your question. One more question. No, it's actually a request of the chair, Ms. Chair. Here, here's my point of this questioning. If we find the money for this population, that's well and good. But if we don't have the provider network that is quality, we are creating a secondary problem that is gonna come if we don't have that quality provider network. I think it would behoove this committee or somebody, if this committee doesn't wanna take it, to do an assessment of where we are currently and project what the needs are gonna be if we dump 3,000 people out there and know that the quality services are going to be in place if the money comes available because otherwise we're going to be dealing with a different set of problems whether chairs want to take that on with the yep. limited time or divert that to somebody else i just want that issue on the table so we make sure that money's one thing quality is another thing what, what i heard representative hammer help help me understand if this works what, what i heard the deputy director say was she's working on a plan and is going to be working on a plan so that she could start in july and the expectation is seven to nine hundred people and have a plan should we let the folks do their work and then as they tell us here's where i need help then we can come in and say you know would it help if we assessed you know thing a b or c and then they can kind of direct us as to what help looks like would that suffice at this I, point i think that's fine i just want the issue on the table so that we as a legislative branch are aware of it and dhs knows that the legislative branch is aware of it so we can work together to do that and if this committee runs out of time and public health picks it up or somebody else picks it up because last time i checked you and i are both going to get back in again in november so i don't think we're going anywhere very good thank you mr chair uh, but, but what i do want to make sure that we don't lose sight of because it's always sexy 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 to expand services and spend more money 
We love it. The executive branch loves it. Everybody loves it because you get to run down the street talking about how you are helping people. Okay? And we spend a lot of time talking about that as we should. And I think it's wonderful. And I know that's a big project on your plate. And if you're like most human beings, you weigh the amount of words spent talking about a subject to determine its relative importance. That's the way human beings operate. But I want to make sure we're not losing, and Director Gillespie, I mean, this really redounds to you, is we've got a number, at least $835 million that we are going to cut, and that is not going to be subsumed to all the other things that need to happen in the organization. And so if you need help from us to make sure we have the resources to do all the things we're asking you for, I'd, I'd really like to make sure you're letting us know that so that we don't get behind on the hard, unpleasant, the stuff nobody wants to do, the stuff everybody yells at, because the taxpayers, they just go to work every day. They never come to these meetings. They never call anybody. They never say, thank you for saving me 28 cents on my tax last week for this thing that you changed that made things more efficient. But they show up when it comes time to do the things that are important for us so we can't forget them. So I want to make sure that I put enough words on the other side of the scale so that it at least gets closer to balance. Yes, sir. Senator Apert, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think this is for the procurement director. Very technical, and it's definitely not a sexy question. Uh, Chairman Charles Collins, excuse me. Um, when you're doing procurements, um, answer me this. Do you have to do, because you got two RFPs on here, do you have to issue RFPs for any service that DHS contracts for? No. It depends on the thresholds and the amount of the total projected cost of that resultant contract. And those are set forth um, in Arkansas code. Um, and it depends if it's a spend of less than $10,000, for instance, that's just considered a small purchase and we can issue a purchase order okay. for that amount. Um, there are some other resultant thresholds in the middle there. Um, there are some things that we can do an, an invitation for bid, for instance. There are some things around commodities. We also can use standing state contracts that OSP holds. So there's a variety of different ways that we can procure these from the marketplace. So it depends. Yes. Then, uh, okay. And then a, a threshold, let's say, of all of those qualified, you know, those different aspects that are qualified, depending on the issue, uh, is it a 500,000 or 100,000? What is that threshold that sort of, you know that if it's gonna be in excess of X, that you typically do an RFP? Typically, um, in excess of 10000 if it's okay. anything over that, we really look at some form of competitive bidding, and then you really get into tiered levels of a, if it's a report to this body or if it's a review by this body. And then in terms of, of uh, because DHS and all the different agencies, you got a lot of different interaction going on. Uh, if you have a service that falls outside of a state agency, that then falls under your procurement. That's guidance. correct. And so between sister agencies, we do not have to do competitive procurement. We can just work directly with that sister agency. We can talk about a scope of work. We can talk about deliverables and what would be the budget around that. And then if it pierces one of the thresholds for either report or review, then it comes before peer or subcommittee. I would appreciate, since we pierced the question, and, and, and Director Gillespie, I appreciate you answering those questions earlier. Uh, I'd appreciate maybe if you get with me uh, okay. about the, uh, the situation with AHIM, because it's not a state agency. And so I don't know if a memorandum of understanding can actually just take care of that. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, that's all we have on the list, so I think you can press on. We uh, Down to the RFP for dental. Did you discuss that yet? Or? I did not, but I'll be okay. happy to do so okay. now. 
So uh, Office of State Procurement is the sign buyer for this action. The draft RFP was released and posted on August the 31st. Due to Arkansas um, code, we are only allowed to post a request for proposal for no fewer than five days and not in excess of 30 days. So as a result, we um, and OSP came to the decision that we would post a draft RFP in order to give vendors adequate notice of what the business requirements and specifications would be. Um, since then, there have been two addenda released, one on September the 19th and another on September the 20th. Both of those addressed actuarial rates uh, regarding the rate ranges um, on the beneficiary cost. Then there was a vendors conference focused on those actuarial rates that was held here in Little Rock on September the 22nd. About 30 people were in attendance as well as our actuaries who came in from Arizona. They were live and went through um, a demonstration and presented some slides and also answered very pointed questions about how the rate ranges were formulated. OSP posted those slides publicly the following day on September the 23rd. The final official version of the RFP is slated to post on October the 5th, and we anticipate that vendor question and answers will also be released as an addendum on October the 5th. Tentatively bid opening or responses from vendors are due on November the 2nd to the Office of State Procurement with a projected final award in the latter part of December, hopefully making us timely for a January review date and that way the contract can be in place and effective in January and that puts us on track for implementation, um, contract start date, things of that nature and then having beneficiaries fully on board January of 2018. At this point, all questions um, substantively from vendors, from stakeholders, lobbyists, and others must go through the Office of State Procurement, and Tamara DeBoard is the assigned buyer with that office. I'd be happy to answer any questions as I'm able. Okay. Representative Ferguson, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just one thing I wanted to make the committee aware of, and I wanted to make sure that you all had been aware. We actually the, met with the governor. One of the unintended consequences we didn't realize when we entered this managed care arena was that uh, Medicaid providers, physicians, e everyone who participates in Medicare has had an opportunity for a deferred compensation program. It's very much like your employ state employees. It's the same deferred compensation program. And that's been a real incentive for providers to participate because they can put their uh, a certain amount of money into deferred compensation every year from their Medicaid payments. And the real concern of a lot of dentists, and I think which will adversely affect participation, is will they will you be able to create an avenue for deferred compensation for the managed care dollars? So at this point, our legal team has advised us that we would not be able to implement the same type of deferred compensation plan directly through us because again, the dentists will not be employed by Medicaid. Instead, they would be in the provider network with the managed care organization. Now that being said, the managed care organization certainly can pursue a deferred compensation plan if that's how they would like to onboard providers. I think the real rub there, frankly, is going to be how do we get to the amount of savings that have been projected to this body and that the Stephen Group has spoken around looking at that 5% target to excise dental care out of in-house Medicaid and place it with a managed care organization. So um, certainly the managed care organization, if they would like to pursue deferred comp with providers, they would be open to doing that. But since the payment flow is not gonna be directly from Medicaid's coffers to the dentist, we don't have a mechan mechanism legally to do that that we're able to see at this point. I guess, can it be a requirement of the RFP that the people who participate in the managed care program do that, that they offer a deferred compensation element to the payment structure? So certainly, 
we can structure the RFP in any way necessary, but again, I think it's gonna be very difficult to offset that deferred comp with the amount of savings that was the purpose for moving this to managed care in the first instance. But certainly, um, I think you all had the meeting with the governor's office, is my understanding that they're taking a look at this issue, and certainly we're happy to visit with you all around this issue. Um, I know we've been having those talks for some weeks and months now. Um, we can put it in the RFP, certainly. I just don't know how the dental managed care organization will be able to re realize the savings that we're trying to press them toward while funding this. Yeah, I just want the committee to be aware, I mean, if any kind of managed care program, I, the, the being able to defer some income into tax-free deferred compensation is a huge incentive for providers to participate because Medicaid reimbursement is already so low. Um, it's just a consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's all we have. We want to press on to who's going to update us on the behavioral health rule change timeline. My name is Charlie Green. I'm the director of behavioral health services at DHS. Uh, as most of you are aware, the Office of Medicaid Inspector General uh, ran a rule through public health and then rules and regs and the council last or in the past couple of weeks, and that is scheduled to implement. That was for um, a, a soft cap on group psychotherapy. That's scheduled to implement on October 1st. The larger behavioral health transformation that we've been talking about for many, many months uh, that we feel like is going to be a, a real good package for our, uh, our, our population as well as providing some savings is on track to be reviewed in public health and rules and regs in October, November. Uh, with an implementation date of July 1st of 17. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Charlie, can I just make sure that I understand what the expression soft cap means? So today, as I understand it, there's no cap. You can go for services 365 days a year if somebody chooses to do that. The rule change limits at 25 the number of days you can do the services. However, the expression soft cap means that if a provider and or a patient have a need to go above and beyond the cap, to go above and beyond the 25, then they would behave just like anybody who works for a private company and has insurance to the private company they would call the, uh, the overseer and then document the need and then get the uh, additional services approved in that fashion. Is, is that what you mean by a soft cap? Well, and, and I'll, I'll let Ms. Uh, Smith, when she comes up this afternoon, address this more if she wants to. Obviously, this is an initiative that came out of her office, but that's the term she's been using, and that's how she's described it as well. Discussions we've had, and Don can correct me if I get off track, is that there is an, ex, a, an avenue for an extension of benefits for people who have a, a, a documented need for more services than uh, are allowed in that first go round of prior authorization request. Yeah, she, she's got a spot in the agenda here later if we need to ask her that. Uh, any other questions on that? Okay, the next item is uh, Arkansas Works Waiver Implementation and uh, New Initiatives Update. Thank you. Uh, I'll take two minutes. Thank you. I'll begin that update, and then uh, as necessary, Mary Franklin is here as well if we want to go into uh, some of the details. Particularly, I know there were some questions around uh, the work underway with the Department of Workforce Services uh, and what we're doing around kind of the work referrals um, more specifically. Uh, just, to, just to give kind of a, a little bit of an update on uh, the process overall, uh, as we reported to this task force in previous meetings, uh, we are in the final stages of discussions with CMS, the Federal Medicaid Agency, uh, regarding the waiver for Arkansas Works. Uh, we are very close uh, to getting approval. We're down to uh, working on some of the language around the requests, uh, I think just as an example, 
one of the requests that was in the uh, package uh, was to be able to waive uh, non-emergency transportation for individuals participating in the employer-sponsored insurance program. Uh, we do think that um, we will be able to achieve that waiver. Uh, however, CMS has asked us to put in some language around uh, what they're calling a hardship exemption. Uh, basically, if an individual, for example, uh, particularly for Arkansas, given the rurality of the state, uh, you know, lives in uh, an area of the state does not have access to public transportation and the person's not able to access uh, a vehicle or some other ride to get to a doctor's offices, that we have uh, a process in place where they could then apply for uh, and potentially receive a hardship exemption to get those services, but that in general, there would be a waiver of non-emergency transportation for that population. So just kind of an example of <laughs> some of the language we're working through at the moment on the waiver side. Um, beyond that, we have teams uh, throughout the department uh, that are meeting on a regular basis uh, with folks uh, internally and externally to then develop out the transition plan uh, as we move from the private option to Arkansas Works, uh, including working with uh, the carriers who are uh, offering the qualified health plans around the issues such as premiums, um, around cost sharing, around uh, some of the new wellness uh, components of Arkansas Works. Uh, and then as I mentioned, we are also working very closely with the Department of Workforce Services uh, to then actually implement uh, the referrals, uh, which was part of the requirement for the program. Uh, and just a note on that, um, the, the act itself requires that we give referrals only for those with uh, incomes of 50% uh, of the federal poverty level or less. We actually, because this is such an important component uh, to us and to the program, we're actually planning to, uh, to initiate referrals for everyone uh, enrolled within Arkansas Works. Uh, and so we've been meeting very closely with Department of Workforce Services, developing out the process for individuals both at the time of application as well as at renewal uh, to be able to get information about the referral to Department of Workforce Services, uh, including sharing information that the Department of Workforce Services has developed around what kinds of services and programs are available and how folks can go about getting that information. So I'll pause there, but certainly we're happy to answer questions folks may have. So when would you think, if they approved the waiver, that the referrals would begin? Mary Franklin, Department of Human Services, Division of County Operations. We will start the referral process in January, and every new approval for Arkansas Works and everyone who is renewed during that month, and then the consecutive months thereafter will, be, will receive that referral. Will there be any tracking process to see what happened with those referrals, whether they contacted the employer? Or? Yes, we are also working on that process with the Department of Workforce Services to establish the information we want to capture so that we can track progress of the referral process. Yes, okay. sir. Rep. Steve Hammer. Hey, Mr. Chair, in that matter right there of contacting employers, did you do anything or was there any latitude to do anything as far as what that requirement was? Because I know sometimes people just call and say, are you hiring or are those two subject matters related or what? Talk, can you explain, explain that a little bit? Our, work, our referral will refer people to the services that are provided at the Department of Workforce Service, which can include a job search, um, readiness programs, resume writing, in, you know, those, those types of programs that Workforce Services offers everyone. So we're just making sure that our Arkansas Works population is aware that they can receive those services. Okay, that just refers them to DWS, but that doesn't deal with when the person actually goes out and tries to find employment and has the face-to-face -face right. contact with the potential employer. Your, your scope doesn't allow you to step over into that area, does it? No, that's DWS. Okay. Um, who, and it is a good partnership, and um, um, Daryl Bassett and I are working, have our teams working very closely together, and one of uh, the things we talked about this week is we hope within the next month to be able to put together um, a, good, a good overview for you as to how we're going to implement this component together, as well as um, how we're going to work in our SNAP, ENT as a part of this, so that we, we begin to pull together all the places where we're doing employment training and work referrals and show you kind of a merged operation between our two, our two separate agencies. And then a set of tracking reports um, as to how we're going to jointly track whether or not the folks that we move through this system actually end up with a job and 
really how these programs are working together. Okay, when would you, is that gonna come, you're gonna bring that before this committee or when would you expect that to happen? If, if the chairs will, will invite us, yes, we, we would love to be able to come and bring that and, and show you what we're, what we're planning to do, uh, DWS and DHS together, because it is a joint effort. Is that the intent of the chairs, yep. if I may put you on the spot? Thank you. Okay, I th that's all we have on the list, and I think that's all you all have on your update schedule there. So uh, thank you for uh, being prepared to jump to the front of the line there. Thank you, guys you for letting us jump. Yeah, Appreciate that's it. Right. Okay, members, uh, we're going to go ahead. Before we start the Stephen group, since we know theirs is going to take a while and we'll have to break them into lunch, uh, let's see. Elizabeth, are you here? Do you want to go ahead and do the OMIG thing before lunch? Why don't you come on down, because I think it kind of ties with what we've already talked about. Hello. Good morning. Go ahead and are you going to have your lawyer with you today or no? Not at this time. All right. It depends on the questions, right? <laughs> You're recognized, Elizabeth. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth Smith, the Medicaid Inspector General for Arkansas. Um, and I think you were asking for an update on the behavioral health rule change. Um, Charlie Green explained the status. It, this rule was passed on Friday through the Legislative Council, and it is to be implemented. October 1st, is that what we, 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 they can do it that fast? That's the implementation date on the documentation on the public notice. Um, it's been filed with the Secretary of State's office um, and potentially there's a waiting period for that, but um, I, I believe it's to be implemented. Okay. Any questions? I, I, I just, uh, Ms. Smith, so we've got the two pieces of the rule change happen, and then a, a third thing is coming soon that's going to change the rate from essentially $52 an hour down to $40 an hour. Is that correct? And that's coming later. That's correct. Okay. I told you that would be quick. Thank you, Elizabeth. There's no question, so appreciate the update. Thank uh, you. And I did have, on, on the agenda, they also wanted me to speak to the personal care right, right. issue. Do you want me to save that for later? No, nope, go ahead. Okay. So just real quickly, I'll explain the personal care initiative that we are working on. Um, what we've looked at is personal care providers and other service workers on a lower level are not, this is not behavioral health, this is a whole different story. Um, they're not necessarily identified as a provider through Medicaid. And the problem is that you may have an agency who bills on behalf of a service provider, but multiple recipients, like at, there's four different examples I can give you. Um, quickly, that a, an agency may bill for a provider to provide services, but they may provide for this person, for this person, and for this person, for three different recipients at the same time, but we don't know that through analytics. Um, also, an agency may bill for a provider for unrealistic hours, and the agency may not realize that they're billing out this provider at 18 hours in a day or, or 20 hours in a day or something like that that could be impossible. Um, the other issue may be that the provider um, potentially either works for two different agencies or allegedly works for two different agencies, and the agency may bill for the provider um, giving services at their location, you know, on behalf of them, as well as on, an, on behalf of another location at the same time. Um, the fourth example would be where the agency bills for a provider giving services at a particular time when maybe that person works for Pizza Hut or something else. And we've actually seen all of these scenarios through audits, um, and we've had issues with this. We've also been working with the AG's Medicaid Fraud Control Unit uh, relating to this because there is obviously potential for fraud there, and we've, we've seen fraud in this area. So what we've done is we've put together a working group with DAAS and DMS to identify, to review the issue, to make some determinations, and to get forward some recommendations. Uh, we are going to be meeting with the MMIS group for DHS um, and HP um, to see what computer system issues that we may have. Uh, we have a meeting scheduled October 20th with Optum to see what tools we currently have that we can utilize um, to make this, to solve this problem. We've looked at other states. Um, Alaska has something that they utilize and the federal government is looking to require identification of these providers 
um, through, I think they're calling it EVV, electronic verification, um, and verif verification, I don't remember what it's called exactly, I'm sorry, I apologize for that. Um, but that'll be coming through, so that's something for you guys to watch for for us. And I think that will really help us um, to cut down on um, fraud, waste, and abuse through the personal care um, situation, as well as other service worker um, situations, not simply just through the DAAS population. Okay. Anybody have any questions on that? We do have a couple. Representative Hammer, you're recognized. Thank you. And we, you know, we just came through a long battle, you know, with the uh, with the changes and everything. And this this is a question I just want to ask you publicly. And maybe it's my own ignorance, so you feel free to straighten me out. But OMIG's involvement in coming involved with situations like what we just dealt with that just went through rules and everything, I'm just curious, why are you the one that has to bring the recommendation for the policy changes and moving forward as other issues become apparent that OMIG discovers and brings recommended changes? Why is OMIG the one that's bringing them forward and not DHS himself? And can you talk to that matter and just give me your thoughts on that? Well, I can tell you why I bring issues forward, and that is when I see problems, that's, that's my, my role. The statute that created the Office of Medicaid Inspector General actually states that we will implement, we will recommend and implement changes to the Medicaid manual um, to combat fraud, waste, and abuse in the Medicaid program. So I'm charged by statute to do that. So that's one of the reasons why I bring, why I bring these issues forward. Um, I've been before the healthcare task force because I, uh, about the group psychotherapy issue, I had brought that issue up and had explained the concerns that we had and explained our recommendations um, to the Stephen group, to DHS, and so we were requested to come before the healthcare task force to explain those issues. Um, and then the healthcare task force asked us to push forward with those recommendations to make those changes. And the justification for the changes that you bring is under what's written into statute, then it either qualifies under the fraud, waste, or abuse criteria that if you, in your determination as director of OMIG, identify areas where changes need to be made, you, you can defend your position coming before us on the basis that any recommendations is going to address one of those three areas. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Rapert, you're recognized. Yes. Um, Thank you for coming today. Uh, my question is, I guess, uh, um, Representative Hammer's quite handled that question, which is one that, that frankly, I did have that same concern. But I want to ask a specific question uh, because, obviously, uh, a lot of confusion came out of uh, last week. Uh, but I did want to ask, as it relates to, because you've made these recommendations, so you obviously know all the implications of the decision. Uh, what of the argument that's been posed that 9-11, uh, you know, 9-11 classification people uh, that I guess have criminal charges, but they are being held in a facility because we don't have enough state hospitals to house them, what's going to happen to those people? So, that, I mean, because that's the big question to me because, uh, you know, that, that one is the one that I really would like to know what the answer is uh, until there is – some changes next year. I mean, what's going to happen to those people if they can't take care of them? Certainly. I'm happy to answer that, and that is something that I've been answering through the Public Health Committee, the Health Care Task, I mean, the um, Rules Committee, and then at ALC. So the um, population that, when you say Act 911, these are people that have been declared not guilty by mental disease or defect, and the court has ordered that they be in a facility right. for protection. And that population of people, if they are receiving services now through Medicaid and they need group psychotherapy and it's determined that it's medically necessary, then they would go through that same process to make a request. If they need more than 100 units, which would be 25 sessions, then they would make that request, the facility on their behalf, the provider on their behalf, would make a request through that um, prior authorization process to receive an extension of those number of units. And so it, I realize that a lot of legislators have been contacted by a number of lobbyists and by a number of providers. Um, 
and I know that they are saying that they believe that there will be a problem for their population. I do not believe that is the case. Beacon is reviewing medical necessity for these claims and they will continue to review medical necessity for these claims. Um, the concern is if they've been providing services to patients or recipients who don't necessarily need it. If it's not medically necessary, then yes, it will affect their pocketbook. And so if, if you're receiving concerns by providers who are very concerned about their pocketbook, that's my concern. Well, my, my biggest concern is that statement that we're gonna close our doors. I've heard that too, and I don't believe that's necessary. In fact, um, we, I met with one of the providers who, or actually the provider who said she was going to have to close her doors. And if, that, if they wanna make a business decision to close their doors for whatever reason, that's their decision. But the state of Arkansas will, we will find another option. There will be something else. And that's what I'm asking you because I mean, we don't want these people cast out into some general population situation. These are Act 911 uh, criminally insane people. And we don't have, as some other states have, many as I've even heard as many as 15 state hospitals. We have one. Correct. And, and what happened is we have developed a system by which these people are handled in a private situation. And so when this decision is made without an alternative, I'm just asking, I mean, we need to know what we're going to do. And, and, and so I have, I mean, I just have a real concern uh, about what happens right. till, Correct. Next, and, till next year. And I agree with you, Senator. I, I totally agree with you. I, I was a prosecutor. I've placed, you know, criminals in jail. I mean, that was part of my, that was my beginning. As I started out as a prosecutor. And so of course I don't want criminals running the streets and I do not believe that that is what's going to happen. Um, but I can't control a prov If a provider wants to close their doors, that's their prerogative. Um, we will have to make determinations for certain things. But I do want to make sure you understand the population that we're talking about um, that receive the group psychotherapy. So the billing code is numbered 90853. And my office has a team of data analytics um, that we ran the data for all the claims that have come through in the past three years, 2013, 14, and 15. And we've been running data for now to see how many people have actually built, how many code times that claim has been billed for how many different people. And we found 10,000 Medicaid recipients have billed that code. But of that number, there's only about somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people that would fall into either the Act 911 population who've actually been declared not guilty by mental disease or defect and according to my meeting with the state hospital, they explained to me that that number is 465. The 9-11 population is 465. But that potentially there could be other people who haven't been declared not guilty by mental disease or defect or who would fall into that criminal bubble. And so maybe we could say between 500 and 1,000 versus the whole 10,000 population of people who are billing this code. And so the concern for me is integrity of our program. And I'm concerned that, see, I know a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't think that's a problem, but, but I am concerned. CMS has come down to other states and declared that there are issues with the billing when there are no limitations and when it's, when it's being provided too broadly. I understand. So last follow up on that, cause you really helped me a little bit. So if, if, one of these institutions make good on closing their doors, where are you gonna put these people? We'll figure that out. But the rule's been implemented and comes into effect October 1. So what will we do? That's next week. We don't know at this point. Yeah. So, so let me, let me, let me, let's say there were a hundred drugstores or a hundred car washes and, and then all of a sudden the rules changed on how much money people want to spend in car washes, the, the market would take care of that. And if there's a problem, then it's not going to happen all at once and we'll clearly be able to react. But, but what I want to make sure that I understand, because this issue keeps coming up, 
over and over and over again about what is a soft cap. So I'm going to use an analogy, and Elizabeth, you tell me if I got this right. In my house, my mother used to say, you can go in the refrigerator whenever you want, and I would just go in the refrigerator all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. And then she said to me, Charlie, after meals, I want you to make a case for going in the refrigerator. And as long as I could make the case where I could go back in the refrigerator, then I could get more food out of there. Isn't that what we're talking about? Isn't this a typical standard element that workers that work for all the companies in Arkansas go through for health care routinely, that they get prior authorization for certain things? I mean, isn't this a proven method that works for millions of our Kansans that we're just applying in this instance to make sure that if somebody has a need, they will be taken care of. They will not be turned away, and the cap will adjust accordingly. That's what the plan does, correct? That's correct. And I can speak to um, specifically an appeal that came through Beacon where a um, patient had requested extension of benefits where or had requested authorization for particular units. The patient had been receiving the same therapy for the past long period of time, I mean, years or a couple of years, I think, I'm not exactly sure, but it had been a good period of time. And there was a change by, um, in the authorization, they said, well, we're, we're not gonna authorize this now. But there was no indication as to why they did not want to authorize that any longer. And so that authorization was turned, was denied, that the denial of the, additional units was overturned by the hearing officer because they said there's been no justification as to why you would stop this. And so currently they have met, they're proving medical necessity and they're currently going through this process. And so we, we run the risk every day of the providers closing their doors. If a provider wants to choose to close their doors, they would do that. And they're just, they're, well, what, I believe we, that they are saying well, this as a scare tactic. Sure. When you look at our population, we have 10,000 people. There's only about 465. One, the provider who said they were going to close their door, they have 48 people. You're right. But what, what we have here, though, and again, you've done a good job answering the question. But again, when you're dealing with this particular class, this group, that's, that's where my concern is, is what happens with those people. And what okay, I we've have got been, four more on the been, list, Senator, what I've, so what wrap I've it up been with another question. Here, what I've been, actually, there were some things brought up, Mr. Chairman, that I'm just closing up on. Uh, Charlie has had the floor while you were gone. Uh, in terms of, of this particular population, I just am hearing that with the changes that were coming next year, that there was built in, they knew there was going to be a change to handle this. I just wanted to make sure that we're not creating a short-term crisis. That's what I was asking. I agree with you. I do not want to create a short-term crisis, and I do not believe that that's what's happening. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Senator Cooper, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Elizabeth, uh, you say that uh, uh, if these people are judged uh, in need of services, they'll be provided services. The fact is they're there because of a court order already, because they have been through a court system. And apparently that's not changed. You know, they're, still in, they're still found not guilty because of reason of insanity. And their insanity is still present. So what's going to describe for me, if you will, the, the uh, patient that is there that, that that situation might change for? You've explained it very well. It won't. It shouldn't change for them. Okay, you've made my point. Um, can, can, Beacon, can, can Beacon handle these reassessments? How long is it going to take them to do reassessments for all these people? They will be able to handle this. We met with them, what was it, Monday? What day it is today? <laughs> Wednesday. We met with them on Monday, and they will be able to handle this. Okay. They've already started a process where every three months they're reviewing the assessments 
No, it's actually called a prior authorization. They're reviewing a treatment plan. So this, this is not necessarily additional work for Beacon because they started a process in July to review the treatment plan and a prior authorization every three months. And so this request, if they need additional units, will just be folded into that program, into that process. The medical provider will simply state on the request for prior authorization, which is already required, it's not new today, this was required in July, that the provider would simply state, we need more than 100 units because of whatever the provider would act, the medical provider would articulate. Well, what I'm hearing you saying is, is, is trust us, but I, I'm a little short on that. Well. Um, how, mu how much are we paying per day for these uh, patients that are there? Per so patient per day? For the group psychotherapy? For the patients that are housed in these 9-11 facilities? Um, I can give you the information for the group psychotherapy bill and that would be, right now, it's $82.80 um, $82 for an hour and a half session per day per person. Um, if they get an hour and a half session times 12 people, it'd be like 930 something dollars um, for, for an hour and a half. But I can't give you the, I don't know the, to, I don't have the number today for you. I can get it for you. But if you're talking about how much do the providers bill Medicaid, what, what other I'm asking services is how much is the state the of Arkansas paying per, per patient per day to house them in those facilities, those lockup facilities? Okay, I can get that information for you. Does, does $175 per day sound reasonable? I want to, I, I, I can't tell you. I know exactly how much the group psychotherapy billing code is for that day for that population for anybody who builds that code. Okay. But, but I don't know the makeup. I know we've got that data, but I, I didn't prepare that today, but I can provide that to you in a few minutes. What, what I would like to have is how that compares per patient per day in these private facilities versus how much we're paying uh, in the state hospital per patient per day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Ferguson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, yeah, I completely understand the um, extension of benefits and all that. I guess I had mentioned to Medicaid, is there some something in process to expedite that process and make it less burdensome? I know for a physician's office it's a little bit different process, but it, it is a lot of paperwork and a lot of administrative burden to do an extension of benefits for the amount of dollars you end up getting back. So I would think particularly for this 911 population, is there a plan in place to expedite that process and make it less of administrative burden for the facilities that are having to do that? It's, it should be no more burdensome than, it, than the current process because the current process, and Don can chime in, but the current process is every three months they go through a process for authorization, they provide the treatment plan. On that treatment plan they will list the units that are requested, the reason, the medical necessity, and all of that. And so it's just simply adding the piece that says more than 100 units. I mean, they just add five more words. I get how, how much additional inform. I mean, I know for a physician office, you have to send all this ridiculous amount of stuff, and they won't even take your electronic health record remittance advice. You have to have the one from Medicaid and the, the, the denial from Medicaid, and then uh, they only keep them online for 60 days, so you go back to get the RA, you have to pay 25 cents a sheet to have it mailed from HP. I mean, it is a ridiculous process, the extension and benefit process with Medicaid. I, I'm not as familiar with the behavioral health side, so I guess that's my question. You know, I mean, we have somebody work two hours on paperwork and mail it in for $2 to get $30. I mean, it, it is an unbelievable process. Is that what is the process for this 911 extension of benefit PA process? I mean, what kind of burden is that going to be to get this extension for these facilities? Just, just to add to what Elizabeth said, you know, really what the providers do today, this, this is a process that is already in place. Uh, and so to the extent that they are already 
um, <clears throat> requesting either um, prior authorizations to serve this population. Um, they can, just as today, going forward after October 1st, they can go ahead and then uh, request extension of benefits. Um, certainly, you know, I'm sorry to hear about um, your experience with some of the other areas uh, around prior authorization extension benefits and would love to talk more about if there are solutions or ideas, things we can implement <coughs> with HP, Beacon, or others to be able to help reduce some of that burden. Um, but part of what Beacon also does for us beyond um, just going through the paperwork is they also do education with providers on how best to be able to submit that paperwork. I know one of the challenges we've had in the past, and um, Beacon has helped us um, and continues to help us work through that, is to make sure that when providers submit that information, they are submitting everything that's needed, including the justification for why they may need uh, additional units. And so they, they have done that training, they'll continue to do that training, but but certainly, um, you know, if, 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 there are, um, if there are additional um, challenges or burdens that may be in the system today, we would love to be able to talk more about that and figure out how to reduce that overall, not just specific to this population. Yeah, because it is a process. I mean, you have to, you know, you have a, we have a whole checklist we go through. You have to get the referral from the doctor, and then if they left one procedure off, you have to go back and get a new referral. And then, like I said, you won't even accept the electronic health record RA. You have to get the one off the Medicaid site, which nobody really does anymore. I, I, I don't know as much about the behavioral health part, but if it's anything like for physicians' offices, it's a process. And that, that really, I mean, particularly for this population that needs a quick turnaround with the extension of benefits, that really needs to be streamlined in some way. Thank you. Okay, Representative Hammer, you're last on the list, and we're going to come back at 1 o'clock for lunch, so the longer you talk, the less lunch we have. <laughs> I'll try to leave the sexy talk out of it then. <laughs> the current providers, what under their current contractual requirements are they, what are they required to give you in way of notice that they're shutting down, and what's the transitional time built into the understanding with them? 30 days, 60 days? Just, just to clarify, in, in the majority of instances, um, providers who do business with Medicaid actually enroll. We don't have contracts with them per se, so it would be just like a physician or anybody else who, if they decided to no longer do business, they would need to, to notify us of that. But I don't think off the top of my head that there's um, any kinds of um, timeline within that since they are not actual contracts, but rather provider enrollment agreements. But we can certainly share additional information with you um, on that if it would be helpful. But I would say with all of these um, providers, I think as Elizabeth said, we have met with certainly um, the provider um, in question here, with others, um, certainly with Birch, um, uh, Mr. Keithley, and others. And um, you know, we do feel like there is a process in place to be able to offer additional benefits um, to those members, um, and certainly want to continue those discussions that if one of those facilities feels like that they can no longer do that, we would want to work very closely with them as we have in other situations when providers have um, discontinued offering services to be able to then find other providers within the community uh, to be able to offer those services um, as, as we have done when these situations have arisen in the past. How many other providers and the main two players that have been at the table for discussion are Birch and Mid-South, I think it is, up in Jonesboro. How many other providers in the state are able to take the 9-11 populations? I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. I know there, there are at least a few others. Um, I don't know, Dr. Green, if he knows that number off the top of his head. No, but we can certainly get that to you. I'd like to know how many other providers, just because, honestly, uh, we've accelerated the date from, uh, from next year, July 31st, whatever it is, to October 1st. And, and the discussion's been had, the decision's been made, now we're going to deal with whatever comes. I would like to know the number of other providers that are able to take that population, because what I hear you saying is, theoretically, they could call you tomorrow and say, we're done. Here you go, um, and and I think it's imperative that as a legislative branch, you communicate that to us as quickly as possible, so we don't find out in the newspaper. Number one, and then number two, it's it's roughly around two hundred dollars a day if a if a private provider takes care of the 9/11 population. I think it's six hundred dollars a day at Ash. So the motive for us to work together as a team with Beacon and with these providers and with you is certainly on the side of trying to make sure if they need a soft cap, you know, extension, that if they run into any roadblocks, it's certainly better for us to work on $200 a day than $600 a day. Is that a fair? Absolutely. Okay. 
All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, members, that's all we have before lunch. We're going to break till 1 o'clock, then we'll come back and we'll pick up item D, the Stevens Group report. We are adjourned till 1 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>